You've heard of Chinatown, but what about Koreantown? According to the United States Census, Flushing in Queens, New York, represents the largest municipality in the United States with a density of at least 500 Korean Americans per square mile. On today's episode of Fake News, we have Korean American businesswoman Jane Rhee with us to discuss her experiences growing up in what is known to be the second largest population of ethnic Koreans outside of Korea. This is your host, Frida Salmoran, live from Flushing, New York. Jane, thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. How does it feel to be back in the neighborhood you grew up in? Thanks so much for having me. It's definitely weird to be back. I never thought I'd end up still in Queens in such close proximity to the neighborhood. But my business partner Nina and I have been so busy with work lately that it's been hard to find time to come back to food. I usually try to come back for church every Sunday, but when I miss one, it ends up being weeks. Are you still attending the same church? Yes, but it's more of a habit I try to honor than anything else. A habit? How so? It was fundamental to my time living with my Uncle Sang and the family. We went to church every Sunday. On the way, you passed the American Roman Catholic Church, the Korean Roman Catholic Church, the Chinese Buddhist Temple, the Pakistani Mosque, and an ever-expanding assortment of Korean Presbyterian and Methodist churches. It's a big part of the culture here. Are you familiar with Timothy S. Lee's article, Korean Americans in the Presbyterian Church? I am. Actually, my ex-employer Beth Mazur sent me that article a few weeks ago. We catch up every now and then, and it's not rare for her to send me articles. Great. Well, to recap, the article says that in a little over a generation, Korean-American Presbyterian churches grew from about 20 churches to nearly 400, becoming the second largest racial or ethnic minority community in the denomination. It then builds a profile of the church structure, saying that second-generation Korean-Americans are a minority in the community, with their diversion experiences complicating the balance that the first generation struck between ethnic particularity and integration. How has your experience been similar to or different from this? I've definitely seen this phenomena at play. Although I was born in Korea, I was too young to remember my time there, and I've lived my whole developmental life here, so I've always considered myself second generation. It's definitely true that Sang and Hannah found their way into the tight-knit community that I always felt I was on the outside of. They still have weekly post-service lunch with the church officials and the other first-generation couples, which makes up their social circle. Meanwhile, I run into Eunice every now and then when she's visiting home, but she was the closest thing to a friend I ever felt in the community. What about Mary and George? Do you feel more or less tied to them, and have you discussed these feelings with them? Mary and George are family, so I don't see my relationships with them as tied to the church community. Church is just something we were taken to together, just a part of our lives. For those unfamiliar with the article, historian Timothy Smith says, In general, neither melting pot parishes nor melting pot denominations seem to have been as successful as the more exclusively ethnic ones in firing the deep emotions to kinship and belonging, which enabled them to mold and shape the life of the immigrant in the new world. This is, in general, true. However, there is a subset of the population for which this is complicated. Lee tells us that it was clergywomen in the 2010 General Assembly who first made this point. For the first time, they portrayed Korean churches as diminishing institutions rather than empowering ones, at least for women and second-generation Koreans. As both a woman and a second-generation Korean-American, do you agree with this? Absolutely. I think I have to. I don't think any of it is intentional per se, but I have definitely experienced this. It's been interesting for me because not only am I in between first and second generations, but even within the second generation crowd, I only really got along with Eunice. Jessica Bay and her friends were always too elitist for me. Even so, I was the only one in the age group who was half Korean. This was huge for me because I often found myself feeling on the outside of the outsider group. It was a very stressful time. What helped you work through that stress, and do you think you found a sense of belonging? 
Well, I think what helped me the most was knowing I was on my way out. If I had had to stay, I'm not sure what I would have done or how I would have handled it. This is one of the lesser known ways that taking the job as a nanny at the Mazer Farley residence helped me. I felt like I had more agency in my life than the church structure gave me. It took a bigger toll on me than I liked to admit, and I struggled to even admit to myself when I was feeling down. I recently read an article from the Asian American Journal of Psychology titled Attitudes Towards Professional Counseling Among Asian American College Students, Acculturation, Conceptions of Mental Illness, and Loss of Face, which, in part, studies the effects of acculturation and loss of face on the conceptions of mental health of Asian American students. Are you familiar with these terms? I am. These are actually terms I learned from Beth as well. I can try to define them if you'd like. Acculturation is typically regarded as a complex, multidimensional process that assesses the extent to which a group maintains their traditional culture, or uh, the extent to which the group abandons its traditional culture in order to embrace the host culture. Loss of face is a measure of the sense of social integrity in the relationships between people in a group. Great. Thanks so much, Jane. So, from the study, we know that loss of face is an important ethnic cultural variable for Asian American students and can have serious effects on an individual's social behavior. Further, we are told that Asian Americans who feel highly assimilated to the host culture, or, in other words, have high levels of acculturation, are less likely to exhibit symptoms of shame or loss of face towards sneaking professional help may conceptualize mental health in positive ways, and may have more positive attitudes towards seeking help. From your experience, do you agree or disagree with this? This is a difficult question for me because I've seen my friends and family react to this in different ways. Since I spent most of my life here, I consider myself to have high levels of acculturation, but that was always independent from the home I was raised in. That was something I had to work for on my own so I could feel a sense of belonging, like I fit in here. So while I was in college here in New York, I was very much aware of the positive mental health movements that were present on campus. I generally saw it in a positive light, but I never really applied it to myself. Since you mentioned your friend's experiences, Tracy et al. found that Asian American students were more likely to perceive academic and vocational problems as presenting concerns appropriate for counseling, while white Americans were more likely to be comfortable disclosing emotional or interpersonal concerns in counseling. Do you find this to be true? This was especially true for me while we were all job hunting as undergrad was coming to an end. Since I didn't associate my high levels of acculturation with my household, I didn't feel the same sense of agency back home. I felt a lot of pressure from the Korean community to succeed, especially whenever my uncle sang brought up my failure to attend Columbia, which, for the record, was for financial reasons. That was the one time I can remember that I considered using the mental health resources available on campus. Thank you so much for sharing with us, Jane. This brings today's episode of Fake News to a close, but to learn more about Jane's work, visit her website, www.janereed.com.